Good evening and welcome. I'm Sarah Miglio, Dean of Curriculum and Advising here at Wheaton College. It's an honor to gather tonight so that we may learn from Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor. Our event this evening is part of an annual series that seeks to ask an enduring question and then explore faithful responses through a variety of liberal arts disciplines. So tonight, we'll consider the question of what is truth. We'll also ask how can reading literature help us discern what is true and what is good. Our first year seminar students have spent the past few months reading and talking about what is the good life. Dr. Swallow Pryor is well equipped to help us ask and answer that particular question. In fact, she's written a book on how reading literature helps us find what the good life is. I highly recommend that you take the time to read this book, Reading Well, Finding the Good Life Through Great Books. Dr. Swallow Pryor is currently a professor of English at Liberty University, where she's won multiple teaching awards. Next year, she will join the faculty of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary as a research professor of English and Christianity and culture. Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor is a reader. She's a writer and a tweeter. She's a professor. She's also a leading evangelical voice and public intellectual. She writes with bold insightfulness on literature, culture, belief, and ethics. Her essays and articles have appeared in The Atlantic, First Things, Christianity Today, and many other publications. She's the author of a number of books, including Booked, Literature in the Soul of Me, Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, Poet, Reformer, Abolitionist, and most recently, On Reading Well. Yes, you should read Dr. Swallow Pryor's books, but may I recommend one specific essay you must not miss? Few of us have been hit by a bus and live to teach others, about how we are easily distracted by other sins but miss our own sinful tendencies. I know that you will, like me, be convicted and encouraged as you read her Christianity Today essay titled, Sin is Like Walking in Front of a Bus, What My Recent Accident Taught Me About Repentance. Thank you, Karen, for modeling for all of us what it looks like to be disciples who are creative and faithful courageous and winsome. After Karen's talk, our very own Dr. Richard Hughes Gibson will join her for a brief conversation here on the stage. Dr. Gibson is an associate professor in Wheaton College's English department. He's the author of Forgiveness in Victorian Literature, as well as two forthcoming books, Charitable Writing, A Meditation on Faith and Writing, that he co-authored with Dr. James Bartler, also here in Wheaton College's English department. And he's the author of Paper Electronic Literature, a media archaeology of born digital creative writing. Dr. Gibson has a lot of interesting hobbies and passions. <laughs> His essays on literature, technology, and culture have appeared in venues such as Books and Culture, Inside Higher Ed, and The Hedgehog Review. Please join me now in, wa in welcoming Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. That's Emily Dickinson. Art is the lie that reveals the truth. This statement is attributed to Pablo Picasso, who, truth be told, probably never actually said it, but could have, or at least should have. <laughs> truth is the darndest thing. Dickinson's insight that truth is so big, so bright, that it can only blind our finite human eyes explains not only the reason for art, for poetry, and for literature, but even suggests the purpose of the incarnation itself. Truth is the logos that holds the universe together, that turns the dial of eternity for infinity, and yet 
is small enough to be carried in the womb of a virgin, then swaddled in cloth and placed in her arms. Truth is infinite in both directions, from magnificent to minuscule. It exceeds the capacity of human vision and comprehension. It is, as the poet William Blake describes it, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Truth is unchanging, eternal, universal, and absolute. I'm Southern Baptist, can't you tell? <laughs> Yet we are capable of seeing, grasping, and knowing so little of it in our narrow lifetimes that we easily think we cannot know it at all. But that is like thinking that because we cannot drink the entire lake, we need not a glass of water. Our very lives depend on that water. Indeed, we must drink it again and again. We thirst and we seek satisfaction for that thirst. But seeking the truth is one thing. Finding it is another altogether. To be sure, every age has its challenges to knowing truth. The challenges in our age seem particularly challenging because, well, I suppose because they are our challenges. Some years ago, I read an article uh, that made a startling claim. I think this article was actually in a print newspaper before things were online. And I have looked and looked and tried to find that article, and I cannot. It has disappeared. But its startling claim was, about 25 years ago, that the information age that we were about to embark on would usher us into a new dark ages in which the difficulty of distinguishing, and by the way, I do know that the dark ages, like that's a, a, a term that is disputed, but it's a metaphor here, okay? Um, <laughs> that, that this new dark age would render the difficulty of distinguishing truth from falsehood as it was then. We can no, would no longer be able to distinguish the sig significant from the trivial, and we would be like the preliterate pre cultures of long ago. When I read this article, I mean, I knew we were entering the information age. I'd been hearing about it and reading about it for years, yet I could not imagine having too much information. I couldn't imagine it. I didn't know how that could result in something like the Dark Ages. And yet here I am tonight, all these years later, and it's not only imaginable, it's here. A new dark age of hopelessly blurred distinctions among real reporting, opinion writing, blogging, conspiracy theories, and fake news, all of which make the truth increasingly difficult to find. One study, for example, revealed a dismaying inability among college students to distinguish reliable news sources from less reliable or even fake ones. Uh, and we, we know that, that there has been testimony over the past couple of years about Facebook and other forms of social media going before Congress, trying to, to stem the flow of absolutely fake uh, news stories. And even the myths that modern marketing in America relies on, and you can fill in your favorite here um, about these marketing myths. I, I have a couple I'm thinking of, um, but I don't want to upset the essential oils people. Um, <laughs> So sometimes these myths rival, I think, the medieval trafficking of holy relics for their supposed healing powers. And there are many others you can, you can fill in there. It is fitting then that a few years ago, the Oxford Dictionary selected the new word post-truth as the word of the year. This was in 2016. At that time, Oxford defined this term as an adjective, quote, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. In tracing the word's rise, Oxford pointed to the recent popularization, and I don't know, some of you might be old enough to remember this one, um, made famous on Saturday Night Live, of the word truthiness which refers to the quality or seeming, uh, seemingness of being felt to be true, even if not necessarily true. I suppose the replacement for truthiness in the past couple of years is ish, right? Attached to whatever word. Um, 
The term post-truth depends in part, the Oxford editors explained, on the evolution of the meaning of the prefix post, which now means not simply after, but also refers to a time in which the specified concept has become unimportant or irrelevant. So it's not just afterwards, but also meaning that it's a time when the irre irrelevance of the term dominates. In other words, post-truth doesn't describe just conditions in which the truth is so, no longer seen as existing. This is kind of the boogeyman that a lot of um, Christians have associated with postmodernism. It's more than that, because it describes an even more alarming condition in which truth isn't even considered important at all. In his 1986 book, America, the French theorist Jacques Baudrillard cited the election of a, a celebrity, a superstar, um, not a reality TV star, this was before that, um, but a Hollywood actor named Ronald Reagan. Um, he cited the, his ascendancy to the presidency of the United States as evidence of what he and other philosophers call the hyper-real. Hyper-reality describes a postmodern, highly technological society in which the lines between the real and simulations of the real become hopelessly, although often purposely, blurred to the point that we can no longer distinguish between reality and imitations of reality. Or sometimes we actually even prefer the um, simulation to the real. Um, so a few examples are um, the marketing campaign around Coca-Cola, um, which, by the way, was original. I mean, Coca-Cola was originally a drink, a soft drink that had cocaine in it. That's, it's been a long time since that's been in there, so don't get too excited. Um, but then <laughs> it got, you know, even long after that, its marketing tag was the real thing. But it, at that point, it wasn't the real thing because the Coke had long been taken out. So it was a simulation when it, at the moment that it became called the real thing. Um, another example is... Um, well, even architecture like this building and the academic building in which my own office is housed back in Virginia where we have these wonderful columns that are often made out of something that, like cement that is a hollow t around a hollow tube, which is an imitation of plaster, which is an imitation of marble, which, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe marble's the original. But we have so many uh, simulations around us and we don't know what the real thing is. Uh, I was explaining this to a, to a friend um, a while ago, and she gave the example of the first time she ever went to roaming around the ancient streets of Italy. And she found herself saying, wow, this is just like Epcot Center. <laughs> this is hyper-reality. But the nature of truth is that it does exist whether we know it or not. Theologian Roger Olson points out insightfully that the larger questions about living in a post-truth culture are not so much epistemological, but ontological. In other words, a post-truth world has come about not because of disagreements about how we know what we know, which is epistemology, but rather, the disagreements are about whether or not there is, in fact, such a thing as truth, and if there is, what that actually means to us as we live and move and have our being, which is ontology. In his famous foreword to amusing our, or preface to amusing ourselves to death, Neil Postman explains the difference between the dystopian visions cast in George Orwell's novel 1984 and that found in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. This is uh, from Postman, writing about both of those two contrasting dystopian visions. He says, um, uh, let's see, no, I, I don't have the quote, I'm just going to explain it. Orwell feared, he, he based, famously um, said that Huxley was right. Um, Orwell feared that though, yeah, this is the quote, sorry. Orwell feared that those who would, feared those who would deprive us of information Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be re reduced to passivity and egoism. 
Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. This was 1984, people. I feel like Postman was such a prophet. Um, Huxley feared, Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the, what Postman called the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumple puppy, whatever those, are, whatever those words are. He continues, in Brave New World, uh, the people are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Postman famously says, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us, Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. While Postman's argument was that Huxley was right, the idea of being in a post-truth culture, I think, gives evidence that both Orwell's and Huxley's visions have come to pass. The post-truth condition finds us as objects, outside, uh, as objects of outside manipulation by political, ideological, and various other agents, and at the same time, subjects of our inner preferences, prejudices, desires, and biases. This combination of external suppression and internal subject selectivity leaves us perhaps not better off than our forebears of a preliterate age who were susceptible to the misleadings of myth, superstition, su superstition, and false teaching. Christians, more than anyone, should care enough to evaluate and verify information carefully and to seek knowledge from trustworthy and varied sources. For the gospel truth doesn't erase our need for, to do the hard work it takes to discern the smaller truths, along with them the distortions and falsehoods of everyday life. Of course, the gospel is the highest and most scandalous truth claim ever made, that God became man, dwelt among us, died for our sins, and rose again. To affirm this truth is to affirm not only the importance of its truth, but of all truth, wherever it may be found, as Augustine urged us long ago. And yet to reject it, to, de to deem the gospel as false, is paradoxically also a truth claim, an affirmation in itself of the existence of truth. So while the term post-truth might be relatively new, the underlying assumption it rests upon is as old as that asked of Jesus when he stood trial so long ago. In response to his declaration that he came into the world to testify to the truth, Pontius Pilate asked, what is truth? But I don't think Pilate was asking about mere facts. Truth is more than the facts of the matter. Truth encompasses not merely the what, but also the why, the who, and I'm increasingly thinking, most importantly, the how. Truth is about who we are, why we exist, and how we are to live. No facts make sense apart from these truths. Apart from a sense about the truth of human meaning and purpose, we are left floundering. We grasp on to whatever it might seem can save us from the isolation and angst of merely existing. We grab hold of identities, of politics, of materialism, consumerism, all kinds of isms, churchianity, or even the American dream. And this is exactly what Willie Loman did. This tragic figure from one of the greatest works of modern literature offers a picture of a life lived in the midst of illusion, one based loosely on an assemblage of various facts, but utterly lacking truth. Willie Loman, when the play opens, leads the quintessential American life, characteristic of what Henry David Thoreau meant when he wrote a century earlier that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Willie's case of desperation is cloaked in the glossy veneer of the American dream, beneath which, however, we find an empty, corrupted version of a once honorable ideal. When Death of a Salesman opens, Willie is dying. His memory is failing. He constantly tells his sons that the key to success in life is being well-liked. 
But as his appearances decline and as his old contacts disappear, his sales d diminish and his failures increase until he is fired from his job and his world crashes. The title of the play, again, Death of a Salesman, has two references and they are inextricably linked. The first reference, spoiler alert, is the salesman dies, okay? Um, but the other is a reference in, made in passing in the play, and it's very important. It's a story within the story of another salesman, Dave Singleman. And notice the name. We have Lowman, who is a low man, and Singleman, who is a man who has a single purpose. Willie met Dave Singleman years before when Dave was 84 years old. Dave, Willie says, would put on his green velvet slippers and pick up his phone and call the buyers, and without ever leaving his room, he made his living. Beholden to a vision for success that belonged to someone else, Willie decided that selling was the greatest career a man could want. What could be more satisfying, he asked. For when Dave Civil Singleman ended up dying all those years ago, Willie says, he died the death of a salesman in his green velvet slippers in the smoker of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford going into Boston. When he died, hundreds of salesmen and buyers were at his funeral. So for Willie, these green velvet slippers symbolize the attainment of his deepest longing to be well-liked. So this is the desire that takes hold in Willie's imagination. It is conscripted within him more and more deeply over time as he lives his life according to the habits and rituals of a corrupted American dream, one marked by shiny cars, new appliances, and if you've read the play, you remember this, whipped cheese in a can. This false vision of the good life that drives Willie for the rest of his life ultimately drives him to his death. As the vision falters, and with it, Willie's own moral imagination, he emerges late in the play from one of his reveries into the past with the sudden realization that in his life, nothing's planted. He says, I don't have a thing in the ground. So he rushes off to get some seeds. His son Biff finds him later outside, late at night, planting the seeds. The action is emblematic. It's not literal seeds that Willie has neglected to plant, but the seeds of enduring real values that he realizes only now that he has failed to implant in his sons. At one point near the end of the play, Biff says to Willie, we never told the truth for 10 minutes in this house. Biff goes on to tell Willie that Willie had so blown Biff full of hot air while he was growing up the hot air of unrealistic expectations and false illusions, lies, that Biff never realized the difference between a false vision and a true one until it is almost too late. Finally, Biff realizes that all I want is out there waiting for me the minute I say I know who I am. Why did Willie's life as a salesman constitute the pursuit of a false dream? I mean, there's really nothing wrong with being a salesman. But as the play makes clear, Willie suppressed his true nature and sold himself out to become something he wasn't called to be. As we learn from various revelations in the play, it wasn't making sales that made Willie happy. It was making things with his hands. Reflecting later upon his father's self-inflicted death, Biff remarks, there were a lot of nice days when he'd come home from a trip or on Sundays, making the stoop, finishing the cellar, putting on the new porch, when he built the bedroom and put up the garage. There's more of him in that front stoop than in all the sales he made. After Willie's death, immediately following his funeral, to which no one came, Willie's son Biff says of his father, he had the wrong dreams, all, all wrong. He never knew who he was. Biff continues again, the man didn't know who he was. And in not knowing who he was, Billy bought in, Willie bought into a false vision of what it was he should become. Death of a Salesman is one of my favorite plays to teach to my college students. You all are in a place that's one of the most vulnerable in your life. 
in that liminal space between dependence and independence, between adolescence and adulthood. You often come to college thinking you are possessed of a vision of the good life. You know what the truth is, but more often than not, the vision that you have, the truth that you hold, is one that's been merely received. It's been passed on to you by your parents, by your friends, by social media. You don't quite know who you are yet. And who you think you are is usually a collage of fragments formed from parental expectations, from peer pressure, and again, increasingly, social media, decreasingly, sadly, the church. But the work of your own moral imaginations that are being developed here in your classes, with your professors, with your friends, as you grow and study and learn and hopefully seek truth, is helping to cast a vision for you for the good life that has been fitted for each of you by your creator. The good life, as many philosophers throughout the ages have shown, is the virtuous life, the life oriented toward human excellence, an excellence which can be, be defined only by our purpose. For example, we cannot judge the virtue or excellence of a bicycle or a hammer or a shoe unless we know its purpose. In the same way, we cannot judge the truth or virtue of our, human, our humanity or our individual lives apart from a sense of that purpose. The concept of virtue or excellence is an inherent acknowledgement, not only that truth exists, but also that truth is important to answering not just what, but more so why and how we ought to live. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, thank you to Karen for that wonderful, wonderful talk. I want to address you audience members and tell you a little bit about how it feels to be sitting in this chair at this moment. Um, and to explain this to you, I need to uh, tell you about an experience I had last week reading the Wall Street Journal. So I was reading, uh, as I like to do in the morning before I come to work, I was reading an article about um, a seminary in Texas and I got about uh, three quarters of the way through, and suddenly I was reading a really interesting quote from a woman named Karen Swallow Pryor. And I had two thoughts. The first one was, yikes! Karen Swallow Pryor is a cultural authority. I'm going to have to raise my game for this. <laughs> and my second thought was, yikes! If I screw this up, is Karen Swallow Pryor going to tell the Wall Street Journal that I'm very bad at my job? Will Maybe. my parents be calling me tomorrow morning asking me, why is your name in the Wall Street Journal? And why is it that we paid for that expensive liberal arts education? <laughs> That's how I'm feeling at this moment. Now to Karen. <laughs> I think this is really about you. Um, so one of the things that I was really struck by uh, in Karen's talk was her discussion about our position uh, our information age having turned out to be something of a disinformation age. But she also talked to us a bit about truth as a set of embodied practices. Uh, truth isn't just something you believe, it's something you do. And so the place I want to start is, uh, I want, I'd like to hear you talk about the practices that we might be cultivating, or maybe that you personally cultivate, in order to live a life of truth-seeking, truth-telling, and maybe once in a while, truth-finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, this might sound familiar to some of you, depending on, on your background, if you have one similar to mine. Um, I, as a Christian, became very enamored with something called Christian worldview mm. a number of years ago. Uh, I think most Christian colleges, you know, are kind of into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I... I'm, I'm kind of a thinking person. I love thinking, and to me, my personality is such as if I can figure something out and think the right way, I'm just going to act mm. that way, too. And so I, I've spent the past 20 years um, teaching Christian college students how to think and what to think and what the right answer is. Um, it was good enough for me. Um, and so I was, over the years, I've been kind of puzzled about why it is that we can kind of teach the right thing to think and what the right answer is, and yet not necessarily do the right thing. Now I know there's human nature and sin nature and all that in the mix, but I still didn't really understand why it seems like such a struggle to match our actions with our thinking. And then I encountered another thinker named, named James K.A. Smith, mm. 
who writes a lot about what he calls a liturgical anthropology that, well, in, in some, in his popular book, the title of it expresses it, uh, you, are, you are what you love. And he argues that we, we really act not based on our, the beliefs in our heads, but the loves that we have in our hearts. And we do think, we might, just like Willie Loman, he pursued something because he thought, and, and then he developed a whole lifestyle and a whole life on, based on habits and practices that actually led him away from the thing that he truly loved in his heart. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. Our habits and practices can actually change our loves you know, not all of them, but in, in the same way that we cultivate, you know, a taste for coffee or tea, mm -hmm. um, we cultivate our our loves by what we surround ourselves and how we habituate our lives and how we orient our thoughts and our attention. Um, and so I've, I've kind of forgotten your question, but yes, so our <laughs> habits and practices first reflect our loves, mm -hmm. whether we realize it or not, but then they eventually shape our loves too. And that doesn't always match up with the right answer that we've been taught in Sunday school or English class. Well, and what about, I mean, because of the fact that this came up in your introduction, what about venues like Twitter? So you're a tweeter. Uh, yeah. Right? I, I, Sorry. I'm not trying to condemn them. I'm writing a book called Paper Electronic Literature. So if there's no electronic stuff, there's no career for me. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm interested to know how do you think about that venue, which is somewhat infamous for the spreading of disinformation. Yes, so yeah. how do you see your role in a platform like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Twitter is mainly destructive. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is, you know, it is a it is a form that can, and it can be used for good, I think, or I don't think that I would be there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, it, it's a great platform for sharing good ideas, mm -hmm. for sharing truth, and not and for modeling how to mm -hmm. think about things and how to engage people. Um, and so. But, it, but I, I'm always cautious about what it's cultivating in me. It is cultivating, um, and this is another kind of the example of, of hyper-reality that I don't think I brought up, but I meant to, is, is that it's really easy, and most of us won't have to think hard to realize the truth of this. It's really easy to mistake the number of likes or retweets for real being really liked and being you know, really affirmed. Um, and that, those things, I mean, social media is designed to make us want more mm. of that affirmation mm. um, rather than better affirmation. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very tricky. These are forms that can, can mm. do good and can be used for good, but I think we have to be very mindful of the risks and mm. what we might lose from it, and so we, we need to be intentional about how we use these these things, not just because of the forms themselves, but because of even how designers are exploiting weaknesses yes. and you know in our in our makeup and or just how we're made up to to re to, to to cause us to uh, engage even yeah. more. Yeah. Well, so that's really a question about broadcasting um, and about the way in which we are sharing truths. Um, I wanted to raise uh, a, another way of thinking about truth, and this comes from a book called Telling the Truth. Coincidentally. Uh, yeah, uh, by a Christian writer named Frederick Beekner. The subtitle is The Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. Uh, it, it was a pretty important book, Once Upon a Time, um, uh, and I, I, I recommend it to you all as, as rich devotional reading. Um, but I want to I want to read a passage about silence. Um, so Beekner takes... Pontius Pilate's question, what is truth, as an opportunity to reimagine the story of Pilate. So he, he has a lengthy narrative where he tries to get inside Pilate's head, um, and that narrative ends like this. Pilate says, what is truth? And by way of an answer, the man with the split lip, Jesus, doesn't say a blessed thing or else his not saying anything, that is the blessed thing. And then Beekner continues, the one who hears the truth that is silence before it is a word is Pilate. And he hears it because he has asked to hear it. And he has asked to hear it 
what is truth. He asks, because in a world of many truths and half-truths, he is hungry for truth itself, or failing that, at least the truth that there just is no truth. We are all of us, Pichner says, pilot in our asking after truth, and when we come to church to ask it, the preacher would do well to answer us also with silence, because the truth and the gospel are one, and before the gospel is a word, it too, like truth, is silence. So I wondered if, first of all, you don't have to agree with Beekner. You might find that to just be rather silly. But I'd love to know what you think about the role of silence in our cultivation of truth and in our truth telling. Are there moments where the truth is, is better not uttered or we speak more truly when we are silent? That's an excellent question. And um, I mean, I do think more and more, I think silence is more powerful than our words or opinions mm. and sharing them. And I say that as a very opinionated person who likes to share her opinions a lot. Um, I remember uh, it was a few, it was some years ago um, at a school event and I was quoting one of my favorite authors, Flannery O'Connor, and she has a, one of her famous um, explanations that she makes in Mystery and Manners about her craft and sort of the, the thinking behind her craft because she's known for using, drawing um, grotesque figures and using distortion and violence. And so in explaining why she does that, she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, something like, to the hard of hearing you shout, mm. and to the blind you draw large and startling pictures. Mm. Um, and so that's what she does in her stories. And I remember a student in the, in the audience um, this was just when I, I think there was sort of a shift from toward postmodern culture, whatever you want to, if, if there's such a thing exists. And he said, well, what if now in this postmodern age where there's just so much noise, what if what we really now need now is whispering? Mm. And... Sub, you know, a mm. subdued picture. Mm. And I just, I never stopped thinking about that. And I thought, you know, O'Connor was speaking to one age mm. that needed the shouting and the large startling mm. pictures. But I think we live in a slightly different age where we do need more silence, more softness, um, more hesitance, more willingness to listen. And so for me, the way that is translated in my very opinionated, tweet crazy life is to not only not, but to, to be much more careful, to, to not comment, to not um, offer an opinion on, on everything. Um, you know, there's been a lot in the news too about how the algorithms work and the binary structures that, all, that social media is based on. And we can actually disrupt that by not taking one of those pro or con signs or liking or disliking or, or arguing. And so I think there's a lot of power in that. And so, so silence now is very important now. I, lo I love what At you're times. saying. Yeah. I love what you're saying about whispering though, because it, when someone whispers, the response of those who wish to attend is to draw close, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. when, when someone else whispers, what you have to do is get really close to them to hear them. I know this because I have students who sit in the back and whisper at me, and what I find is I'm just gradually moving across the classroom until I'm basically standing over them and asking, could you speak a little more loudly to me? Uh, but I'm, I'm really struck by that. Um, I, my, my next question, I think, actually builds on what you're saying pretty well. So you've pitched to us that uh, the good life and the true life are entangled, and in order to cultivate these things, we need to cultivate the virtues. Um, uh, and I, I've been thinking about these issues too, and I was really charmed while reading your book to hear descriptions of humility, um, which you describe at one point as an accurate assessment of oneself. Uh, and I wondered if you could speak a bit more about humility's help to us or humility's limitations to us as, as people who are, want to gain truth in the world. Um, should we be humble learners? How should we think about humility's role in our formation, say, as students? Hmm? Yeah, that um, coincidentally, my humility chapter centers on Flannery yeah. O'Connor. Um, and so, so often we use the word humility and we think of it only in its negative connotation, like to be humble is to just be like modest and, you know, not self assuming. Um, but the real definite, I mean, the root of the word 
humble. It comes from the same word that we get hummus from. Um, it means earth. So it, it, it is an accurate self-assessment in understanding that that we are earthly creatures, um, but we're also made in God's image. So we're not God, but we're not animals. Um, is to understand our strengths as well as our weaknesses. To so it's true hum- humility to know what we're good at and as well as what we lack. And so I think where humility comes into truth is to recognize. A- as well as we can, what we what we are convicted about and what we really believe is true, and also to recognize what we don't know, uh, or that other people can hold to the same views for different reasons or to different views for the same reasons. Um, and there's a phrase that I use uh, um, in other places, not in this book, but you know, epistemological humility to realize that we can't know everything, we don't know everything, and we don't know how to know everything. Um, and, and humility, I think, is the, you know, is the beginning of all knowledge. To pay. I mean, I think that's one of the things that um, the Bible is saying when it talks about the fear of God, because being the, the, the beginning of knowledge is because, is that recognition that we are not God. But we still, you know, we're made in his image. That means we are capable of knowing truth. We can ascend ever higher. I think about some of the mystical descriptions of truth as something that's gradually apprehended. Um, so I, I want to ask a, a question that I think naturally follows from, from this one um, about what it's like to study at a liberal arts college. Um, there are a few people in the room who study at a liberal arts college. This might be pertinent. Um, so one of the issues that you frame for us early in the talk is a, a kind of crisis of rival truth claims that are occurring in our culture. And, and, and certainly, things feel much more combustible to me as well about the way in which there's so many rival claims to truth and, and so many almost defamations of other people's attempt to offer truths. But we also experience that to some extent in a liberal arts college environment where we move from semester to semester between multiple departments and we learn about different disciplines, ways of apprehending reality and describing reality. And that can be jarring. I know, I know this from having worked at Wheaton for uh, more than 10 years. That for some students, it's, it's difficult to discover like, wow, this one class is presenting to me a claim that feels at odds with a claim that's happening in another class, or I'm encountering a classmate who comes from a different um, uh, Christian tradition, and their understanding of some central truths is different than mine. So I wondered if, if you could offer any advice to people who find themselves in a position like this, uh, or, or encouragement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a cliched image, but I guess it's cliched because it, it, it's so helpful. It's that old, and I don't know if I'll get it exactly right, but that old image of, of you know, the blind men who are each um, standing near an elephant and feeling mm. a different part, and, and one's got a hold of the tail, the other a trunk, and the other mm. the leg, and they're all describing it very differently mm. um, because they're just describing what they have their hands on and they can't see the rest and a liberal arts education is a lot like you know like feeling the elephant Mm. (laughs) Um, and one class is giving you the tail and another class Mm. is giving you the trunk and it can be disorienting and we will never see the whole elephant but the neat thing that begins to happen and part of this is through study but part of it is actually um, I think cognitive scientists will tell you that that even into our 20s, we're still developing some of the connections mm-hmm. in our brain tissue. And there, when you study more and you develop a certain level of, of your own cognitive um, maturity, you will suddenly start to see how things are connected. Mm. And I just, I remember being in college, you know, as first or second year, uh, and all of a sudden that recognition that something I was studying in psychology mm. actually had something to do with what I was studying in English. It had, school had never been that way my whole life. Mm. Um, and so, again, we will never have the whole picture, but making connections is the most spiritual thing mm. that we can do as human beings because everything about this fallen state is about reconnecting, reconciling with God, reconciling with one another. Mm. Poetry itself, you know, that's something we like, I think. Yeah, poetry itself is all about connections. That's what poetry is. It's connecting through sound and image and juxtaposition. Um, And all of our learning 
is really about connections. Uh, and that's why this moment we find ourselves in today that is so characterized by fragmentation and polarization, one of the most countercultural things that you can do is to seek out the connections and the semblances and the um, and, and, and part participate in the ministry of reconciliation that the gospel calls us to. So you like to make reading lists. And I wondered if you could just suggest one or two, maybe three books or, or articles that have been important for you. I mean, you named Postman. And I also, I, I encourage people to read Postman to try to understand our times. But you know, for people in the room who are, who are, see, who are really interested in what you're saying, and who are going to have time after the semester ends. Um, would you recommend any particular reading that's been formative for you in thinking about some of these questions? Yeah, so uh, Postman definitely. Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, I, that is one of my top books that I recommend to everyone. Uh, it, it's, it might feel a little outdated because he ends with sort of the age of television, but everything he says mm -hmm. is a good foundation for thinking about digital media today. Mm -hmm. Another one that I would recommend I mentioned earlier is um, James K.A. Smith's You Are What You Love, mm -hmm. which is kind of a popular level introduction to this liturgical anthropology that helps us recognize how we are so motivated by the things that we love. And then, you know, the works that were formative for me as a literature lover, I would say number one is Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a wonderful story. It's, it's not, it's got its romantic elements, but it really, really is about a Christian in the modern age seeking who she is in the world and before her God. Mm. I mean, there's no more universal and mm. applicable story than that. Um, so I think that those would be my three top recommendations. And, and Death of a Salesman, if you haven't read it. With, uh, with the last one, are you working on an edition of Jane Eyre? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have your Jane Eyre? Well, it just so happens. <laughs> I really didn't plan this. It's just we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. Uh, I will be writing an introduction to Jane Eyre, maybe probably in the next year. That, so it, it, a special edition as part of a series it, uh, will be issued a vintage kind of cloth bound mm -hmm. edition of Jane Eyre with my introduction and questions. So, so just wait for that one to come out, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Also, cloth bound. That's the way you want to read Jane Eyre. <laughs> All right, this, this is my, my last question. Um, and here I'm going to quote you to you. And I, 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 I read this and I was struck by it. I think that this meeting is an appropriate time to bring this up. I just really would like you to unpack this passage for me. So th this comes from the Reading Well book that we've been advertising. Here's Thanks. what it looks like again. Um, with a foreword by our own Leland Riken, father of the president. Um, <laughs> All right, so, so you start by quoting um, these almost shocking words from Flannery O'Connor. Um, O'Connor says, in the absence of faith, we govern by tenderness. And then she says, when tenderness is detached from the source of tenderness, its logical outcome is terror. And then you say, when love is unmoored from unchanging truth, it becomes mere sentiment or tenderness. And you go on to observe that tenderness doesn't seem to be able to handle the rough patches of the world, particularly suffering, and can quickly become that terror that O'Connor describes. And I'd love to know more about how you understand the relationship between love and unchanging truth. Great question. So, I mean, so it's easy to think of love as a feeling, and it, and it is that, um, but feelings are fickle, and they pass, and they fade, and I think the Bible clearly teaches that agape love, the highest love that we can have for one another, um, not just with all people, but even in our you know, in our so-called romantic relationships, our marriage relationships, our family relationships, um, Feelings are important, but commitment to certain truths is is what gets us through um, the passing of feelings. So, just to use a you know a simple example, if we if we believe in the sanctity of human life, then that means that suffering takes on different meaning, and that we do not 
shy away from people who are suffering, or, or we don't try to prohibit our own suffering uh, because of fear of other people's suffering. And I think of, mm. of the end of life. Um, I'm 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 a baby. I'm I'm the biggest baby of all. I it not you know I do not enjoy pain or watching people suffering or have suffering myself, um, and so because of those those feelings are not the things that I can rely on when um, faced with the the aging and the suffering of my of my grandparents or my parents. Um, we have to have certain convictions about human life. And other, you know, and other things that um, we can cling to when our feelings change, um, when our emotions take over. Um, it's the same with romanticism. Another novel I read, Madame Bovary, just changed my life in that way. Um, and O'Connor's quote is is startling. I mean, she attributed what happened in World War II to with the Holocaust to the triumph of tenderness mm -hmm. and rationalizing the ease of human suffering um, be, rather than, than clinging to unchanging moral truths. So that's a pretty heavy, serious thought. I don't know if I've made it any clearer, but. No, I think you have. Okay. <laughs> so you may, if you've been watching your email, you will realize that this woman has, has given two chapel talks already. I think you have one more to go, is that correct? Yeah, one more tomorrow. She hosted uh, or, or participated in a special event at the English Department and has also been interviewed by the record. We are not paying her enough money for all of the stuff she's doing this week. So we're gonna pay her now by clapping very loudly in gratitude. Thank you. Wow, oh, that's a lot of payment. Thank you. You can do better. There we go.